So Leslie, first of all, you drove me in an Uber or Lyft. I'm not sure which one it was, but you drove me in Minneapolis and we had this great conversation and you recommended this book, A New Earth by Eckhart Tolle. And I read it the following month. I was blown away. So much of the questions that I had in my life were answered by the book. And I'm extremely grateful for you for giving me this text. So thank you. I really right. appreciate it. Hey, glad to do it. Yeah. And so in this conversation, I want to learn more about your life story and how you came across this book, what went on in your life. And I guess a good place to start is for you to introduce yourself. Okay. Uh, I'm Les Howard. Um, and um, I don't know what, what all you want me to tell about myself. You want to tell, you want me to tell my life story? Or... Yeah, go for it. Okay. Well, anyway, I'm the oldest of 12 children. My mother have 12, had 12 kids. Right, and so I'm the oldest. I am 65 years old. I am um, a veteran from the Marine Corps back in the 70s, right at the end of the Vietnam War. I am a former mental health case manager uh, in Dakota County in Minnesota, where I went out to um, community case management, uh, case management uh, clients in the community. And I also did some uh, mental health work in the hospitals and the lockdown unit. Um, what else? Uh, and the way I came up on that book, the question you asked was, I, I don't know if you ever seen these advertisements on Facebook and they tell all the books that's recommended if you want to do some of the things that successful people do. And that was one thing was read a book a month and, uh, and they recommended some books. And then Eckhart Tolle, when I heard, heard about uh, his book regarding staying in the now, I don't know if you read that book, uh, The Power of Now, that was the first book he wrote. And then the second book, you know, about finding out what your purpose is on the earth. I hadn't read that, uh, I didn't read that first. I read The, the Power of Now first. Then when I found out about the other book, I read that book. And I think the second book, Finding Out Your Purpose on Earth, is better than his first book. And uh, then I, I heard that was one of Oprah's picks uh, before I read it. And I read that book and it totally impacted me as far as uh, learning how to keep myself calm, learning not, uh, how not to react, um, um, learning how to forgive people and just accepting people just the way they are and things like that. It really, it really impacted me in that way uh, because sometimes um, just like the book talks about uh, your past experiences in life, the way we were, you were raised can help, can cause you to have uh, certain opinions or biases when it comes to other people. And then, you know, if, you, if you're not aware of it, uh, you can become bitter, angry, and all that stuff. But, but that book kind of opened me up to to understanding other people, actually. So let's go into your childhood. What was that like? Well, I, I man, look, I worked from the age of seven years old. We were poor. We were poor, poor. And my mother had seven kids in seven years, and I'm the oldest. So I started working in the fields at seven years old, bean fields down in Homestead, Florida. I'm down in Florida right now. I decided to come down here to take care of something and uh, actually decided to stay after visiting for a while. So I got to go back to Minnesota and straighten some things out. But anyway, yeah, I grew up uh, in the South in uh, Homestead, Florida, and um um, like I said, my mother had 12 kids and I grew up working, doing stuff. I really didn't have, you know, kids get out and play and do different things like that. I really didn't have that growing up. You know, I had to take care of my siblings, you know, uh, um, go to work. Sometimes I had to be taken out of school to go to work, uh, with my mother. And so, uh, it was tough. It was, it was tough growing up, um, 
in our house because uh, because there were so many of us. What was the most difficult part about having so many siblings? Well, being the oldest, man. I mean, being the oldest, you got all these responsibilities, you know, as a kid. You got to grow up real quick. And uh, you don't have time to, you know, kids uh, nowadays play. They got the video games and all that stuff. I mean, you know, um, I didn't have a lot of time to play. We didn't have video games back then, but I didn't have a lot of time to play. I had I had work to do in the fields and I had work to do at home uh, as the oldest, you know, helping out around the house. So, so yeah, uh, it was tough. And then you said you joined the military at some point? Yeah, actually, I left home at 16. And then um, I had a friend who went to the military who was maybe a couple of years older than I was, went to the, to the Marine Corps. And he came back with that uniform on and I liked the uniform and I wanted to get away. Uh, it's, it's funny. I wanted to get away from home because of all the responsibilities and the authority. And I joined the Marine Corps at 17. <laughs> <laughs> That's more, more responsibilities <laughs> right. and more dealing right. with authority. Right, exactly. You know, but as a teenager, you know, you know, you ain't thinking. You just, you know, you just want to do stuff and get away. And that's how I felt. So I joined in seventeen. Um, uh, my mother had to sign for me, and uh, I went in at seventeen. So was it difficult to convince her to sign for you? Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, we we grew up going to church uh, at least three or four days out of a week. And uh, in those days, the pastor had a lot of authority, okay? And so uh, when I decided to go, my mom said, no. She said, you're not going anywhere, you know? Uh, so so it got the pastor got wind of it. And he said to her, sign the papers and let him go. And that's how I got to go, so. How, how do you convince the pastor to let your mom sign the papers? I didn't, well, I, I don't know if I convinced him. He, during that time, I, I was um, rebelling. At mm. 16, I was rebelling against, you know, not being able to do things. And so, actually, I I, uh, I dropped out of high school. Uh, back in those days, you could do that. And I joined. So, um, I don't know if I convinced him so much. Uh, things just kept coming up um, where I was rebelling a lot and, doing things, running away from home, stuff like that when I was 16. And and then when I turned 17, I said, this is an opportunity right here for me to go in the military. And I'm going. And so um, when he got wind of it, he talked to her. And he heard that I was trying to get her to sign. And so he just told, he advised her uh, to sign him. So. And then you join the military. What do you learn trying to, you're fighting from authority or running from authority, but then you find probably more authority. What was that like in the military? What, what type of lessons did you learn? No, I'm not going to lie to you, Danny. I cried for two weeks after I joined because I was in boot camp. I don't know if you know anything about Marine Corps boot camp. It was really tough. I, you know, I woke up crying for two weeks because, you know, you get yelled at, you get you know, back in those days, uh, recruits got hit, kicked, all that kind of stuff back in the 70s. And, you know, they were, I guess they were calling themselves toughening you up and, and things like that. And um, a lot of, uh, they don't do that now. Um, but back in those days, they really, really um, used that uh, technique to toughen you up, you know, beat you over the head and call you all kind of names and all that kind of stuff. This is during Vietnam going in, you know, I, when I went in, Vietnam was going on, but by the time I got out of boot camp, it was over. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it was, um, it was, it was, it was, I was, I was learning, you know, kid, I was young kid, 17 years old, and I didn't know what I was doing. I'm just, I'm just, <laughs> I did not know what I was doing, so, um, but it was good. I'm glad I joined. I got a lot out of it as far as um, being responsible, you know, um, and submitting to authority and things like that. I got that out of it. And so some toughness, you know, being able to endure things um, more. So that's what I got out of it. And then 
how far after did you end up being out of the military? How long were you in the military? In? Three years. Three years yeah. I was in. And um, yeah, three years. And then what happened next in the story? Well, what happened next was I got a job in the uh, steel mill. And I worked in the steel mill. And uh, after that, I got a job in the post office. And I carried mail in Chicago for five years. And I got really um, caught up in drugs and alcohol during that time. And so, I mean, the post office, you know, partied a lot. And so uh, when I grew up, like I said, I didn't have time to, you know, do the stuff other kids do, did, you know, in school, things like that. Kids were in, into drugs and things like that. So, uh, and I never really, really got deep into it until I got out the military and started working for the post office, you know, start drinking and using drugs and things like that. And so um, that happened. And then, so I, um, I, this is in Chicago. Then I moved to Minnesota uh, 33, 34 years ago. And uh, actually I was homeless. I was homeless in, uh, in Minnesota when I first got here, uh, I got in Minnesota. And somebody, um, you know, I'm gonna say somebody, one of the uh, counselors, I was trying to go to some classes to kind of improve myself. And one of the veterans upward bound counselors said to me, why don't you go to college? Okay. And I never thought I could do college. I never thought I was smart enough to do college. And um, uh, I took his, his advice and I decided I was gonna get a liberal arts degree uh, and that's all. And so I did that. Uh, I got a, a lot of encouragement because I wasn't a, an avid reader. I wasn't really, really, I didn't feel college material. So I graduated after three years of um, intermediate classes and then taking real classes. It took me three years to get an AA degree, a two-year degree. And then the same counselor advised me to go get my bachelor's degree. I really, really was really um, afraid, um, full of fear, not thinking I could do it, uh, but I did it. I went on ahead and I applied to go for my uh, bachelor's degree. And so I went and I got my bachelor's degree uh, at Oxford College over there in uh, Minnesota, Minneapolis. And when I got there, I got mentors and I got in a program called the Ronald McNair Scholar Program that helped students prepare for their masters. You know, I wasn't thinking I was gonna do it, but I took, uh, you know, I got in the program anyway. And so, I mean, this is beyond my wildest dream. Here's a guy that dropped out of high school and I'm getting ready to get my bachelor's and they're talking to me about a master's. And I was so terrified, I didn't know what to do, but um, I followed their instructions um, and I got letters of recommendation. I got a lot of encouragement. I mean, there's just uh, the counselors and the uh, staff at the colleges really, really encouraged me a lot. And so I went to the University of Minnesota and um, I got my master's and became a social worker uh, at the age of 47. And so um, it took I've, me like- what? I have so many questions. I have yeah. so many questions. So, <laughs> w wait a second. You were homeless. Homeless. And, and so, what? How, how does that person convince you to take that first step? Well, you know, I, I like I said, we, and when I growing up, we spent a lot of time in church, you know, and I knew about God, but I didn't, the, the way they did it was kind of like a legalistic thing. And I really, really didn't like the church, but I did get something out of it. And I would be praying, you know, God help me, you know what I'm saying? Not knowing that he heard me because I really, really had a lot of resentment against the church because there was a lot of legalism in there. I felt, you know, you can't do this. You can't do that. You know, God doesn't really love you. That's what I was thinking. He's just waiting on you to make a mistake so he can clobber you on the head. You know, that's the kind of message I got. But, but I found out that, you know, he was really, cause I was crying out from my heart uh, and asking God, you know, for direction. And so, 
um, um, and how the question the question you're asking me, how did I go from homeless to that? Uh, just a series of events and visiting the college, you know, came to my mind and just go take some classes, you know, at the community college. And then I found out about a, a benefit through the VA uh, called the Vote Rehab Program where they pay for your education. And they're gonna pay, they were, they, they were paying for my intermediate classes as well. So I just said, okay, why not? You know, I got a, 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 a monthly stipend for going. And uh, when I went to college, when I started college classes, not only did I get a stipend, they paid for the book. They said they paid for the books. They said, you know, less if you keep uh, three point, uh, two point five grade point average, we'll continue to do this. And so um, through much, I don't know, uh, messing up on my part, you know, I just kept doing it and kept doing it and kept doing it and uh, kept coming back you know, to correct some of the mistakes I was making. And so um, it just, it just happened. <laughs> At what point did you stop and say to yourself, oh my God, I was homeless and now I have a master's degree. Was there a point when you were like, how is this possible or that you were yeah, so in shock? Many times, many, many times, many times, especially after I got the liberal arts degree, my AA degree. I was just blown away because, and like I said, I was really, really terrified to move on after I got that liberal arts degree. And I was like, how could this be? But as I continued, I, I got, I gained courage and confidence in what I could do. And I argued a lot of grades, you know, I thought I was doing better than I was doing. And I argued a lot of grades. And a lot of my instructors said, if you do it over, I did a lot of do-overs. So if they said to me, if you do it over, um, you know, you can get this grade, a higher grade. So I would go home and I would, you know, sometimes like I'm not, sometimes I'd be crying over papers and I'm doing them over, <laughs> you know, I'm typing them over on the computer. This is when PCs were coming out. This is back in the nineties, man. And so um, I did that. And, and got a higher grade. I did a lot of those. A lot, I did a lot of do-overs, seriously. Uh, because really, really, I wasn't, um, I wasn't all that smart. And I don't think you have to be smart if you work hard, you know, and keep pushing and keep pushing. And, um, you know, it can be done, so. So you get a master's in social work. And what do you then do with that? Well, what I do is I start working for a company called Mental Health Resources as a mental health, uh, I'm gonna say serious, working with people with serious and persistent mental illnesses. And what I mean by that is I went out in the community uh, to work with people that were committable, you know, who were maybe threatening their own lives, you know, and was at risk of um, harming themselves and other people on a regular basis. These are people that, that are really, really sick and I, I went out in the community and I worked with those folks, you know, take them to court if they need it, make sure they take their medications, you know, go to group with them, you know, take them to their therapist appointment, you know, maybe just sit down and have, you know, lunch with them, you know, try to, um, try to get their life in some sort of normalcy, advocate for their rent, you know, advocate for their car payment, move furniture around, <laughs> <laughs> deliver furniture, <laughs> deliver furniture. I got, hey, I mean, just because people have a master's degree, I mean, you did, you do all kinds of stuff, anything, whatever it takes to, to keep that client um, in the community and um, not have them go to an institution, whatever it takes. You know, uh, help them pay their bills. I did some rep payee, whatever it took. You know, um, that's what I did. Why is it so bad for them to go to an institution? Well, well, you know, it's it, it's you know they they they're in an institution with other people and they can't be productive in the community. They're, they're trying to get through their uh, their, their mental illness you know, out in the community trying to improve their life, you know, and it's hard to do that if you're in an institution, mm. you know, um, just on medication, you're, 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 
you're just on medication. And But if you're in the community, you got some kind of support in the community groups or case manager, you know, you, you live a better quality of life uh, 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 that you wouldn't otherwise live in an institution. So, Did you experience any stories of transforming people? Oh, um, yeah. Could, any That's, you could share? Well, yeah, you know, going in, I'm going to be honest, going in, I had the life experience, right? And so my idea was, I'm going to go and straighten these people out. That was my idea. They straightened me out. And <laughs> I, <laughs> um, because I went in judging, saying, yeah, they should be able to do this, they should be able to do this, blah, blah, blah. But I don't know, I didn't know where they where they came from. I didn't, I didn't know their life history, you know, how they grew up or any of that, you know, I didn't know them. But um, after a while I learned, uh, I realized that I need to approach them with a non-judgmental attitude, meet them where they're at. A lot of times you get these mental, what they call mental status reports where they give, you know, they write a report on a person, somebody else before I get them and then I read the report. And after I got to know the person, it's not really who they were. The, what the report said, it was totally different what the person is like, you know? And so I learned that uh, it takes time. You know, people have to trust you um, and you gotta be consistent, in the, you know, with them. Uh, otherwise you're not gonna see any change. And that takes time, years. I mean, you know, I worked with a guy for a whole year you know, before I saw a little bit of change. And you got to always congratulate that change, you know, that positive change, always positive affirmations, always building, you know, if you're going to criticize, make sure it's really, really constructive. And, um, uh, but at the same time, you really have to be firm in some areas, uh, especially if it's going to harm uh, you, them, or somebody else. So, yeah. It, it, it's 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 a just like life. What were some of the areas that you needed to be firm with a person? Hold on a second. Uh, somebody was trying to cut in on my phone. Well, one area if they're if they're if 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 they're showing uh, signs where uh, they're not taking their meds and they're trying to harm themselves, you know, I you know, I would have to do something. I have to intervene, and I'd have to you know, get them committed, you know, because I was a mandated reporter. And so that I had to make sure that they know that they, they know it because most of them were, have been committed before. So they know that if they're, if they're doing something like that, um, cause I've had clients who want to harm their mom, their dad, you know, stuff like that, you know, can't let that happen. You mentioned how you can't be judgmental about right. the person or situation. How do you how do you do that practically? How do you do it? Well, you come in with a non-judgmental attitude. Like I said, you get that status report of a person. You got all these things that they did, you know, in their past or whatever. And uh, or, and some they didn't do. It's just a description a lot of times that the person who wrote the report, um, uh, the way they wrote it. And actually, it shouldn't be written like that. You, 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 if even if you write something about somebody, you got to always put a positive spin on it. You know, mm. just like for example, uh, let me see here. Uh, um, uh, what word can I use if a person is like they might say a person is conniving or you know they're trying to do this to trick you or this or that. You know, another way of putting that is they're using their resource skills and to, to try to get their needs back. <laughs> you know, and if you can communicate that to them and show them how to do it the correct way, you know what I'm saying? And they understand that, you, you know what I'm saying? They don't feel so bad about trying it a different way, you know what I'm saying? So so things like that, you know, people, people, you know, they, are, they can, anybody can point out a person's bad points or criticize mm -hmm. anybody can do that i mean but it takes a lot of effort and insight to look at a person and say okay um uh, i'm gonna say something positive to them something edifying and speak to 
the better part of them rather than to speak to what they did because that's not really who they are. What they did is not who they are. And, and if you try to explain that to them and on a consistent basis, it's, it's, a, it's a process. It doesn't happen overnight. You tell them one time, they ain't going to get it. You know, you just have to keep saying it, keep saying it. Then they start trusting you and trusting you. You keep saying it, keep saying it. And, you, you know, it just takes time. And you know what I'm saying? And, and then they become more willing to work with you because that's really what it's all about, I think, uh, developing a relationship. You know, it's, it's relationship-based. Uh, otherwise, uh, you lose them. So, where do you think you get your positive attitude from? A lot of people would look at that report of conniving and see nothing wrong with it, but you want to put a positive spin on it. Where does your positivity come from? Well, I believe it comes from God. Uh, I, I was raised. I had a lot of abuse in, in my family. You know, I'm not gonna get into detail about that, but there was a lot of abuse, physical abuse and emotional abuse, in our house. And so I, um, I, I, like I said, I had, uh, we grew up in church and there was a lot of abuse in the church as well. You know what I'm saying? So, and I rejected it for that reason for a long time, even after the military. But then I, I later developed a relationship with God. And that's what changed me really, that relationship with God and finding out that he is real and that he loves me just the way I am. So in turn, if if he loves me just the way I am, why should I love somebody else the same way? Yeah. And then that book, when I wrote when I read that book, it confirmed most everything I read in the Bible and I, what I learned about God as far as treating people with dignity and respect. And so uh, you get what you give out. You know, if you give that out. I mean, you're going to have a more peaceful um, mindset, you know, if you keep your mind on, on positive things and um, want to see people do well, I mean, your life, you get more peace, man. You get more joy in your heart. I mean, it's, it's a reward. You might not see the reward in the people that you work with. Later, they might get better later. You might not even witness that. But it's something that transforms in your heart that makes the difference. It really does. How did you find God after your childhood of not of rejecting God or rejecting the church at least to begin with? How did you then find God eventually? Dude, a lot of trials that I put myself through. <laughs> Tell me about them. Oh man, you ask these hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you the truth, Danny. Please. I got married the first time, right? And it was a tough marriage. And we I grew up, the way I grew up was you don't get a divorce, I don't care what happens. Right. So I married this lady, you know, it takes two to tango. I'm not gonna blame her on blame everything on her, but it was really, really tough. And um I was afraid to get a divorce. You know, she had some mental health issues. And um, actually, to be honest, she put a knife through my throat and she did some other stuff. I mean, I was doing some stuff. I wasn't perfect either. But, but I mean, the relationship was rocky from the beginning after we got married. We, we got married four months later, we separated. We stayed married for four years. But then what I did was I started praying for her. You know, uh, because I believe God was telling me to pray for her. You know, you know what I'm saying, and not st and stop complaining about her. <laughs> and so, uh, and then God started. To, he started to speak to my heart, and uh, he became real to me. And um, in that way, and things start to change. Um, not so much in our relationship, but the young lady decided she wanted a divorce. I wasn't going to do it because I was scared to do it. But she said she wanted it, you know, and we parted on good terms, you know, pretty pretty good terms. And so, but uh, in the meantime, what I brought away from it is a relationship with God. Um, because when I, when I went into prayer, I was just exploring to see if God was really real because of the way I was, I was raised. It was, he was just just mean God, you know, with, a, with these big old mallet or pop me on the head with it. But, but he proved that he's a loving God 
in that he cared about uh, every uh, area of my life and he wants to talk to me on a regular basis. He wants to commune and have a relationship with me. And I found that out through that marriage. Well, thank you for That's sharing. That's when it started. That's when it started. Yes. So, yeah. so how did the relationship with God continue then? Well, uh, it's continuing now. It's, it, it continued uh, right now. I'm just going to say it continues through prayer and meditation and um, uh, interacting with other people. Because, I mean, I mean, yeah, you can have a relationship with God, but, but he put these people here, you know, to use these people in your life, you know, to get to know him better too. You know, people that you want to impart into and people that can impart in your life, people that get on your nerve uh, that kind of make you a better person. You know what I'm saying? Um, where you can, you know, you can uh, get upset with what they do and not the person, not make it personal. Just the behavior, just look at the behavior and, and, and pray for that person, you know? That don't mean you have to live with them. It just means that, you know, you're, you're you know, you're, you're not, um, you're not able to get along with them. Uh, you don't have to hate them because of what they do. It's what they do. It's not who they are. Les, I want to go back to your ex-wife. Why did you pray for her initially instead of pray for yourself? Because when I prayed, I heard, I heard God, this is the truth. I heard God said, thank me for her. And um, I believe the reason why he said that was um, uh, for what it was doing for me, you, you know, you know what I'm saying? And yeah, she got some issues and I believe God wanted me to pray for her that she gets better, which changed something in my heart. You know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? And, uh, but, but the other side of that, before that, I was just pissed at her. I was upset with her. You, you know what I'm saying? I was blaming her for everything. You, you know what I mean? And so it was creating something in my heart that wasn't good. And so, yeah, so that's, um, I mean, that kind of insight didn't come from my mind. It came from the mind of God. So he put that in my heart to do. I mean, I couldn't have came up with that on my best day. <laughs> <laughs> and so you mentioned prayer and meditation before too. What does that practice look like for you? Well, you know, I believe that according to, you know, what I read in the Bible too, is that, you know, um, it's better to listen than I believe than to talk to God because I believe just like a kid that asks a lot of questions, you know, you ask a question, yeah. But, you know, if you're talking, or let's say you got parents, if you're talking all the time, the kid, you're not going to get, you know, you're not going to get, you ain't going to hear a whole lot. <laughs> It's the same thing with God, you know. Uh, the meditation entails just listening. It's quiet, uh, uh, pushing out all the noise out of your mind, all the worries, all the all other stuff, your problems, everybody else's problems, uh, just that chitter-chatter, TV stuff, cell phone stuff, all that stuff got to go. You know, you got to get, for me, I'm a, I've, since the Marine Corps, I'm a 4, 4.30 in the morning guy. I get up 4, 4.30 in the morning, every morning to do my meditation because everything is still and quiet and it's not a lot, a lot of movement. And so uh, that's in that stillness, I do that meditation. And then uh, I read the Bible and stuff like that. And I pray the words of the Bible uh, over my life and over other people's lives. And, and, um, and that's what that looks like. Yeah. You know? For the meditation, how long do you meditate? Is it just a feeling or? Well, well, you know, um, I think the meditation part gives you, um, like, it's, it's kind of like the Bible, that not the Bible, that, that book I was telling you about. It kind of gives you an ear to hear what God is saying to you. You know what I'm saying? It kind of, um, when you quiet down all that noise down, you can actually be in a spiritual place which I believe we're spirits and God is a spirit and you can hear, you can hear what he's saying and you can hear the more you do it, the clearer it becomes. Um, but the more you do this noise out here and you're always, you're in this drama, 
and you're listening to everybody else's problem, you're watching the news and all that stuff, you can't hear nothing because you, you're inundated with all that negativity in your mind. And um, I, I think God is a positive God. So he wants to tell you some good stuff. And so and I want to hear what he's saying. So I want to get really, really still and quiet and any distraction. Uh, it's just like being with your wife or whatever. You know, you know, I don't want, if I'm with my woman, I don't want no distractions. <laughs> <laughs> so I couldn't agree more with the meditation quieting the mind so that you can hear what God is actually saying. I think that's such a beautiful way to put it. And what, how do you deal with the situation of, let's say you're forced to go into the negative situations. Let's right. say you're driving Uber and right. someone comes in your car with a negative attitude. How do you not let that cloud over your space? Well, you know what? That happens a lot, okay? Not only in the car, but outside the car with other drivers. Mm. I can tell you the incident I had yesterday, actually. Uh, me and a guy almost collided. Um, and I almost had an accident. And the guy was really, really kind of cursing me out, blah, 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 this and that. And I rolled the window. I didn't hear him at first. I rolled the window down to see what he had to say. We didn't have the accident. And in my mind, I'm like, okay, we didn't have an accident. Uh, let's keep it moving because I had to pick this passenger up. But he kept going, you could have hit my car, and blah, 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 blah. This and that and the other. And why did you stop at the stop sign? And so it just came to me because of my relationship with God, I believe. I just rolled the window down and said, uh, have a nice day, sir. You know, and that come out of a relationship with God. In the past, who knows what would have what happened. You know, nowadays, people get so angry, man. They pull out a gun and shoot you just because, you know, uh, they think they're right. You know, mm -hmm. and so, so I'm learning how to deflect uh, certain situations and circumstances. Even when people get in the car, sometimes I don't say nothing, especially if it's political that political stuff, people going off and ranting and raving. You know, I had a police in the car uh, a few weeks ago and he was talking about the police side of the George Floyd thing, you know. The first thing, and they want to ask me my opinion, the first thing I'm saying to myself, don't say nothing because, you know, those, those, those conversations can go places that you don't want them to go. So I think the best thing to do when you find yourself in those situations, you got to pick and choose which, you know, um, what you want to engage conversations. And, um, and I already know that part the politics and, and all that stuff. I don't, I don't engage that, you know, but if a person get in the car and they just want to talk, I'm really interested in learning. A lot of times I get students in the car and I'm, I, you know, I want to, I'm interested in what they're doing and, you know what I'm saying? I want to how, how, you know, how is college and what they're learning, what the major is, all that kind of stuff. I'm really interested in that because I believe I can, especially the brand new students, I believe I can impart some something in, you know, in their life that I've experienced. And so if they're open to that and I feel that, you know, sometimes you can feel it. If they're open to it, you can feel it. And then you can say, okay, well, this is what I tried maybe you know, maybe, maybe you can get something out of it, you know, and, you know, blah, 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 you know, and so then some will take it, some don't. Like I said, when you called, I'm like, wow, this is what I live for. No. <laughs> <laughs> the coincidences and synchronicities of life is what we live for, right? Like the, the so absurd, like, how is that possible? It has to be God it, there. It has to be something greater than me. And that's right, what I, right, you know, right, right. yeah. That's I was what so I excited when I got that text. I was like, oh my God. All day long. I mean, you bless my heart when you sent that text. It's just like, oh wow. This is this is it's it made my whole day. I was, you know, a few days, a couple of days later, I was still thinking about it. So yeah, it was just, just a blessing to see somebody benefiting from something I introduced to them or something that God put in my heart to give them. I don't want to take the credit, but God, I give God all the glory. Because if, if I can be used, uh, I'm open for that. Yeah, so you recommended this book, A New Earth by Eckhart Tolle, which I recommend everyone check out. And right. you said you're on your fourth reading of it. Why, I, why right. four readings? Well, you know, I believe, you know, I read the Bible on a regular basis. Okay, I'm going to tell you this. You know, 
that book kind of uh, increased my faith in the Bible. He make references to the Bible a lot. He make reference to a lot of other religions too. And he doesn't subscribe, doesn't sound like, to no religion. You know what I'm saying? But he gets all this stuff out of there, you know? Yep. And so uh, it really increased my faith in God and in this and in the way he presented it. I never seen it presented that, that way. And so uh, I'm getting something brand new every time I read it. It's brand new. It's like, oh, I didn't see that before. My book is so written up. I got I got margin rolled up. I got underline. I got highlight. I got all kinds of stuff in that book. And I'm getting ready to read it next week for the fifth time. Wow. Yeah. So it, it, it's like, it's you no, know, some books I can read, you know, um, and put them down. But some books I think is worth picking up. I got a couple like that. It's worth picking up more than once, you know, what? to kind of go over it and refresh yourself. Yeah, I agree. The it's second time reading but- this, the second time reading A New Earth, I was like, oh my God, there's so much here that I didn't pick up the first time. And I'm so excited. What are some of those other books for you that you have to go back to reread? Well, I got, I got a, um, a book uh, uh, by Dr. Caroline Leaf. She talks about the brain and the mind. And I'm interested in that kind of stuff. And she talks about um, eating, uh, I forget the title of that book, Eat and Grow Smart or something like that. And she talks about the, the connection between your, your, what you eat and how you think about your food, stuff like that. Kind of, it's similar on the line of Eckhart Tolle about as far as uh, treating the earth like it has value. Mm. But she talks about what you eat and how it affects your body and your attitude, your mood, all that kind of stuff. And her book I've read maybe about two, three times. I read her book, um, that book, and she got a, she's got she got another one called Who Switched On Your Brain or Switched Off Your Brain or something like that. I've read that a couple of times. Uh, and there's another book called The Slight Edge. Um, I forget. I've read that once or twice. So, yeah, it's a few. It's a few that I that I get stuck on. You know. So, like I said, uh, that uh, commercial or that um, that uh, 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 I guess infomercial on Facebook talked about because I was into some uh, selling marketing stuff, and it was talking about you know how you succeed in that, and they said read a book a month, and um, so. Yeah. So, so going I, back to uh, the the you see a kid in your in your car who seems eager and open. What types of things do you look out for when people are in your car and you're trying to figure out if they're open to conversation, open to new learning? Well, if they ask questions, if I start talking and they start asking questions, boy, it's on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if they you know, a lot of times people get in the car, they don't want to talk. I leave them alone. I respect the boundaries. But if they, um, I've had, matter of fact, I had a kid in the, in the car the other day, you know, and he wants to talk. He wants to learn. You can tell. You can tell. You can pick it up when they're, or when young people want to learn. You can tell. And you can tell when they get, when they know everything, you know. You can tell. You just know. And, and when they start reaching out to you and asking you questions and they're eager to listen to what you have to say, you know, that pulls something out of you. You know, you can feel that pull when they when they're doing that, you can feel something on the inside of you, inside of you that that they're pulling on. And so I give it up. I give it up. When they start pulling, I give it all up. <laughs> What's been the most surprising thing you've learned from one of your passengers? Surprising things? Yeah. Has there been anything that has been like, oh wow, I didn't know that or um, a connection you didn't expect or what, what has there been a story that you were like, how is that possible? Other than this one, of course, but. I was going to say this one. That was, <laughs> that's awesome, man. Uh, well, I have, I don't know. I'm not sure Danny. Um, there's many things I've learned uh, about different subjects. Let me see here. You know, I've been doing this for a long time. I probably 
I probably got like, like six, 7,000 brides. I mean, wow. it's like, I've been doing this for a while and I've, um, well, I'll just say what I've learned is people are hurting out there. They got all these situations and circumstances like it talks about in the book in their lives. And I have had people where I've had to turn my app off to talk to them and they ask me to pray for them. I've had situations like that, you know, and I've learned that there's a lot of people hurting and they want somebody to listen to what they have to say. You know, they, they, they really want to hear. They don't want, they don't want you to, to give them a whole lot of solutions of what you think they should do. They just want somebody to listen to them, empathize with them. They don't care how much you know. They just want to know how much you care about them. If you care about them enough to listen to what they have to say, that means a lot to them. And then if you pray for them, I mean, because I'll ask, I don't just do it. You know, I don't get weird or nothing like that. I was, I said, well, you want me to pray for that situation? You know, and then I get the opportunity to impart whatever I got into their life. And so that's the thing I've got out of doing what I do is um, listening. You know, I mean, there's a lot, man. When you, when you read, when you run to people, you, you, you're, some of the stuff can shock you, you know, that some of the stuff that people go through. Um, and um, I'm a I'm a captive audience for them, and they ain't gonna never see me no more. So a lot of times they spill their guts. Mm-hmm. They tell me, if, you know what I'm saying? And um, and that's for them to do that, and for me to be there for them, it's so exciting. So <laughs> it's so powerful, and the connection between being a social worker and being a driver for Uber or Lyft is so similar. And I never thought about that until just now. The ability to listen to people, to truly empathize with their uh, their situation and understand life from their perspective is something, a skill that you obviously have. And so (laughs) what goes into listening to someone well? What what type of thing are you, how, how do you listen to others better? Well, the way I do it, is not formulating answers while they're talking. Don't come up with, you know, what worked for me might not work for them. <laughs> and so I, I, I like to look at them, look at them, give them my undivided attention and just let them talk and not come up with answers and not act like I'm the know-it-all about whatever it is that they're talking about, you know, because people just don't respond well to that. You know, in my experience, they they really don't. Uh, Actually, Danny, I am, when you call me, when you text me, right, what I had done was I, I, I was doing some of the same stuff you're doing, you know, but I never got that far. I got a, I got a, a, a blog, and it's called balancedmen.com. And I haven't worked on it in about a year. And I'm just, and when you did what you did, I was, I'm, I'm in the process of getting back on. And you confirmed to me what I'm supposed to be doing. You know, it's, it's the podcasting and getting myself out there and letting people know um, that there's help out there and maybe presenting some resources. Um, uh, and things like that, and um, and reaching out more. I mean, and the, and the, and the theme I got is is similar to the Uber, um, and that is uh, meeting people where they are and getting them where they want to be, and that's my kind of theme for that. And so I, I'm 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 in the process of getting back into that, doing some old blog posting, writing, and putting myself out there. Um, so somebody can get some help, you know, uh, for whatever it is that they're dealing with in life. So, yeah, that conf- when you text me that, it confirmed uh, my direction that I was going in the right direction. So, so that what I what I presented to you is, is feet. I'm eating now. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. And we'll we'll have that linked in the show notes, your website and everything like that. I want to ask though about, you know, you mentioned before about how people are lost and how people just need someone to speak to. 
what right. do you th- what do you think are the biggest issues that you're that you're seeing in your cars because really you have the pulse of society unlike anyone else you are talking to people on a daily basis wide ranges of people so what do you think the biggest problems are and how do we go about solving them well i'm gonna tell you man nowadays right now it's fear with this corona and all this stuff this stuff in minneapolis there's a lot of fear going on you know on both sides, the police side and, and you know, African American side, it's it's, it's 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 a fear motivated situation where people are not coming together and developing relationships. That's what I think it is, and getting to know each other. You know, it, you know, if you don't know something about somebody, you know, you you create, you get all these uh, imaginations about what they're like, and most of the time, it's wrong. It's not even nowhere near what this person is like. But if you get in there and you, you you get to know them, you know, you can kind of dissipate that fear. I mean, with this Corona thing, there's a lot of media stuff going on. And just my opinion, I think a lot of people uh, with uh, uh, maybe conditions or whatever, and then the Corona thing, and then you mix fear with that. I really think it's, 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 um, it's harming people, that fear, just, the, just that word fear, fear they're gonna die, fear that they're gonna get Corona you know, fear, you know, of people and certain people, certain colors and all that stuff. It's a lot, uh, most of it is fear-based. Um, and um, and I think if people start to get to really, really get to know each other, you gotta spend time to do that. Like I was telling you about my clients. I mean, you know, they, they at first when I started working with them, you know, they, they, they feared what I was like, you know, they, they feared that I was gonna be this tyrant, you know, with authority over their life and commit them and, you know, tell them what to do. And uh, they still had some of that because I was mad that I was controlling their money and, you know, all that stuff. I wasn't controlling it. I was managing it, helping them manage it so they don't get evicted, you know. And so to, to get that, that fear to melt, I had to spend time with them and let them know that I'm, 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 I'm for their best interest, you know. It takes a, takes a minute to get them to convince them, you know. Um, and so it takes time. That, that only happens over time. And then I don't know, they can say all they want about, you know, they're gonna write this law and do this and that and the other. But if people don't come together, you know, and face each other face to face and try to understand each other, it ain't nothing happening. And to, in my guesstimation, it's gonna be hard to get something to change if you don't come face to face and really, really deal with it. Just, just, just accept each other just the way they are because you can't change them. Ain't nothing you can do to change nobody. <laughs> so. when- when you have people who are in fear, what would you suggest someone in fear to do the first step for them to operate more in love or get to the next step, whatever it is from fear? Yeah, I would say, you know, get the facts, you know, don't, don't, don't. I mean, do you, do you, do you investigate and try to get to know the situation, try to understand the situation or whatever it is you're dealing with try to get an understanding of what's going on because really uh, that fear comes from not knowing, you know, the fear of the unknown, you know, a lot of it comes from that, that you know, um, and you get all these mental monsters in your mind about, you know, people, things and situations, you know, and a lot of times we imagine bad things happening that never happen. <laughs> they never happen. <laughs> but, but, and then you got this fear that it's going to happen, you know, and um, that can create all kinds of problems, you know, for your life. So I would say uh, just uh, take your time doing whatever you're doing as far as investigating and try to get some understanding about the situation and don't rush through it. Let it unfold. Let it, let it, let it, let it, let it, let it let it uh, uh, do what it's gonna do, you know, without interrupting it and trying to control it and all that stuff, man, it is, that never works. What if you investigate it and you get more scared and more fearful? Well, if you investigate, you get more scared and more fearful. Well, I don't really know what to tell you. You know, (laughs) (laughs) I would say keep an open mind. 
you know, when you investigate, you know, don't keep, don't be closed minded about it. You know, I mean, try to understand it. I mean, that's the part when I say try to understand it, keep your mind open to receive something and not look for the negative, mm. you know, you know, don't look for the negative in everything, you know, look for some positives, uh, look for the positive period, you know, so when you're investigating, Sometimes people look for the negative, you know, I mean, you know, sometimes if you're not thankful for, for whatever, you know, you're going to look for the negative and everything's negative. And next thing you know, you can, you on, you on the bottom and negative all over you, all on top of you. <laughs> <laughs> and, if I, and, and the opposite works for positive. You know, if you put it out there, positive be on top of you, you know, positive stuff start following you wherever you go. You know, you're going to run into some negative people, but for the most part, you're going to have more um, encounters and uh, be more exposed to positive things if you stay positive. And then you're going to have a fuller, more exciting life. I'm serious. It, it's, it, it just happens that way. I can't explain it. <laughs> Les, what are you thankful for or grateful for? What makes you positive? Well, I'm, I'm, you know, that's a daily, that's a daily thing, man. I mean, I have to do that daily, you know, because, you know, sometimes we default back in our minds to the what ifs and the negative stuff. But on a daily basis, what I do in the morning when I get up, I say, God, I don't know anything. This is the day you made. I need help to get through this day because I don't even know what's going to happen. You, you, you the one made it. And so I'm just going to ask you to help me through this day. Um, and uh, put, you know, whoever you want to put in my path that I can uh, make a positive impact on, you know, and um, hell, I'm, I'm, I'm in a position like hell, you know, I don't, I don't want to um, try to be the know-it-all guy. I don't want to be that person. I can't, I don't, I don't know nothing. I'm just in the scheme of things, you know, <laughs> In the scheme of things, look at all these people all over the world, and I'm looking at how high God is, and all this stuff. This stuff is being created. I'm I'm so, in a way, insignificant. You know what I'm saying? In the scheme of things, how can I think I, I know everything? You know, if I humble myself, uh, what I try to do is stay humble, um, in a big way, because you know pride can come up, can be, be a, a thing that comes up in you. And um, if you don't watch it, if you don't stay aware, uh, it can overtake you. So I try to be mindful of being humble and asking God to help me all the time, all day long, help me in this situation, you know, because sometimes I think I know the answer. But every time I consult and ask God which way to go, and I wait, and I wait, I get the answer. And it's usually not the thing that I thought of, you know, it is, it's sometimes it's weird that it works, you know what I'm saying? Because it didn't come out of this mind. It came out of a, a more um, creative, I want to say creative, intelligent mind, the mind, you know? Mm -hmm. So he just puts it in my mind, you know, so I can get some help and somebody else can experience from the help I got. So, so going back to when you were homeless, what, got you through those days and those weeks? How long was it? Well, I'm going to tell you, it was a period of maybe a year or two, about a year or two. It, it was, you know, Danny, I mean, it, it had to be God. I, I mm -hmm. um, it had to be God that got me through it. I, I lived, uh, I lived with my brother. I've lived, you know, um, in rooming house, you know, after I got off the street. And uh, that's how I really, really got into school. I got into a rooming house. Um, and when I got into that rooming house, I found out the benefit of being able to go to school and I got the help from those people. So it, it was uh, it was a, a, a chain of events of things happening in my life. And it's, it, I believe it was God leading and guiding me to to where I needed to be, you know, uh, when you encounter different people, you don't know why you encountered that person, but that person could be taking you to the next level, you know, but I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that back then. You know, somebody may say something 
actually, come to, when it comes to mind, somebody else, somebody told me about the Veterans Upper Bound Program and what they were doing. And then I went over there to investigate. And then one thing led out to another. And then that's how I got hooked up with school. So, you know, you never know, you know, if I think if we value people, you know, when we meet them and, 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 and try to look for something positive, we get something mm-hmm. of value and we get direction in life. I mean, I believe that's the way God got it set up, you know, uh, for us to love each other and uh, connect with each other and things like that. So, Well, yeah. this has been such a beautiful conversation. Is there anything else you'd like to add or mention before we wrap it up? Well, it's, uh, I, I really, I really appreciate you texting me, Danny. You just, I mean, as I said earlier, what you're doing is what I had planned, I planned to do, but I never put it into action. Now, you know, you, it's kind of like an effect. It's kind of like a, a domino effect. I mentioned the book to you and then you get something out of it. Then you bring it back. And now I see that what you're doing is benefiting other people. And God is showing me I'm supposed to be doing the same thing in the way that you're doing it you know, with the podcast. And what's the title of your, uh, what's the theme of what you're doing? Your theme. It's just pursuing the highest version of ourselves. Right, right. See, now I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the balanced part of ourselves, all three areas, our spirit, soul, and body. And I believe that, that, that can, um, you can manifest a better version of yourself when you, do, you have a balanced life all the way around. So it's the same thing. It's just worded different. You, you're presenting that perspective, that side of it. And then I'm going to be presenting, you know, uh, this side of it. And so, and then I'm doing my part. I was listening to Michael Jackson uh, yesterday um, and his, and that song he wrote, um, looking at the man in the mirror, if you want to song. Yeah. Yeah. And I was thinking about what I want to do, especially I was, I was going in that direction, but then after you, sent that message I was even more encouraged so now I'm putting together a, uh, um, a post about giving you know and uh, I'm, I'm meditating on that and asking God what he wants me to communicate out there put out there regarding giving and that's what you're doing uh, when you do what you do you're giving you're giving something to the world uh, to this planet so uh, that's what God put on my heart uh, to write about and so yeah that's all I got to say man I really appreciate you contacting me and getting in touch with me and um, I'm, I just I just uh, hope all the best for you and and I know you're gonna do great things man I just see it it's just like uh, you're in there that's your book back there that's the podcast cover that uh, oh, okay. that you my brother write, you're yeah. gonna be writing a book too right <laughs> one day it, God yeah. willing. God willing. Oh, yeah. I believe that. Yep. Les, thank you so much for your time and wisdom. And you've given so much to me. So I'm so grateful for you. I'm looking forward to reading that that post on giving. And I really appreciate you, man. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate you as well. 